from protein to medicine. So, so what we will do is um, sort of outlined on the, on the next slide, which I'm going to show you. Um, I will take you on a journey into the into the world of proteins. So we will talk about what is a protein, why are proteins important, and so on. Um, we will talk about protein crystals. We will um, explain what a synchrotron is um, uh, later on in the talk, and. Um, and finally, at the, towards the end of the presentation, um, um, I, I will present some of the recent work that we have done in our research group on an important protein from the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, you can also see these camera symbols here. We have, um, in, in preparation of this event, we have um, um, made some um, instructive videos so at uh, certain stages in this talk, um, we will show a video and um, uh, uh, there's an important organizational part. The first time that a video is shown, you have to allow this audio, uh, this uh, transmission. Uh, so, so you have to click on, um, on the button to allow the, uh, the video to be shown. For the later videos, this does not seem to be a requirement anymore. Um, so let's um, let's jump into um, into the middle of it. Uh, so the first questions that we are asking is, what is a protein? And already at this stage, um, um, I will take a short break and uh, we will uh, show the first uh, video. So remember to allow this uh, uh, transmission thing by clicking on a button. So Miss um, Jennifer, please start the first video. Proteins consist of 20 different building blocks, the amino acids. They all have different properties. Amino acids are linked together by a peptide bond, forming a linear chain with a defined sequence. Rotation around these bonds allows for spatial flexibility. Depending on the amino acid sequence, higher order structures such as helices or sheets are formed. These then come together and form a defined three-dimensional structure. Ultimately, it is this structure that determines the function of the protein. All right, so um, I hope you could all see um, the video. Um, now, why are we talking about proteins? Now, proteins are, are important molecules and, and they are really present everywhere. They're in every organism from virus to bacteria, fungi, plants, animals, humans, and, and they're in every cell. And they do, and they also do everything. They are about what we also call the, the workhorses of the cell. So let me give you a few examples. <clears throat> so for instance, we have enzymes. In this case, this is a digestive enzyme that breaks down our food. Then we have signaling proteins. This is a protein um, from an eye lens that helps us see. Then we have transport proteins that transport certain substances from one part in the body, let's say from the stomach or the intestines across the bloodstream to the cells, to the uh, to storage places. Then we have storage proteins. This is a, a protein in which iron uh, is stored. You know that iron is important. Uh, for um, the red blood cells, and this is a storage protein for irons. Then we have protective proteins. Uh, this is a part of an antibody molecule that, um, uh, that, ma that makes up our immune system, very important um, in, in order to protect the organism from um, any sort of um, attack from other organisms, bacteria, viruses, and, and, and all sorts of other th things. And we also have structural proteins. Um, this is a, a part of a, of a keratin, which is a structural protein that can be found in, in, in skin and bones and, um, and, and um, other tissues as well. So you can see already from this list that, um, that proteins carry out a myriad of functions. Um, and and the, uh, the, the real question behind this, how do they do this? So every protein is characterized and, and is defined by a, a characteristic amino acid sequence. Yeah? You have seen this in the video. 
we have 20 different amino acids and uh, and they are aligned or they, have, um, they follow one after the other in, in, a, in a very defined and characteristic amino acid sequence. So a given protein has a very defined amino acid sequence and proteins also have a very defined and unique three-dimensional structure. And what do I mean when I say three-dimensional structure? This means that, um, that I want to know the, um, the, the relative location and the arrangement of all the many thousands of atoms that make up a protein molecule. And so I really would like to know the three-dimensional coordinates of all of these atoms. Yeah? This um, sounds, first of, all, first of all, it sounds like it's, it's, it's rather complicated, but this is the kind of work we are doing and uh, there are methods around it. And I will try to explain later on um, how we achieve to obtain this uh, structural information. Before we go about that, I would just like to show you a few different representations these are three different schematic representations of the same thing, of a three-dimensional structure of a protein. In this so-called ball and stick representation, every atom in this protein is represented by a little sphere and atoms which have a chemical bond to one another are represented by, a uh, are connected by a stick. This is why this is called ball and stick representation. Um, uh, this is, of course, the, the most accurate representation. It contains the most information, but it's, of, it's a bit inconvenient uh, if we want to um, look at other details. For instance, how the amino acid chain is arranged in three dimensions. For this, we prefer this so-called ribbon representations. And here you can also see these higher order structures that were mentioned in the video, the helices or, uh, or, the, or the sheets how they are arranged and how the amino acid chain is folded up in three dimensions. Yet another representation is what is the so-called surface representation. And this becomes important when we want to analyze and, and um, how this protein or how a given protein interacts with other molecules, with substrates or other proteins. And uh, th this question will become more important uh, to in the later part of this lecture. <clears throat> so what, um, what we want to take out of this uh, from at this point already is the three-dimensional structure of the protein is determined by its amino acid sequence. This is a very important point. Um, and also this three-dimensional structure forms spontaneously in a process that is called protein folding. And the most important um, point that I would like to make, this is also why this is written in bold here, is that it's really the structure that determines the function of the protein. This was also mentioned um, in the later part of the video. Um, if, if there is one sentence you take home from this, then it's, it's, it has to be this one. The structure determines the function of the protein. Now, how do we obtain such a structure? Um, there is a method out there that is called crystal structure analysis, or it's also called X-ray structure analysis. <clears throat> and it's really these two words, crystal and X-ray, that defines um, what is done in this method in order to obtain a three-dimensional structure of a protein. So, so remember crystal and X-rays, and these are the two keywords that we will use in the next couple of slides to explain uh, what we are doing. Now, how do we get proteins to form crystals? Yeah, this sounds a bit odd. You know, if you everybody knows the crystals, the table salt crystals or sugar crystals, what you put in your coffee. Um, but how do, how do we get a protein to form crystals? So what do we need to do to go from a relatively disordered state of protein molecules swimming around in solution in an aqueous environment um, into a state of much more order, which is the crystalline state. And for this, we have prepared um, another video, which I would like to show now. So Jennifer, please show the second video.
protein molecules in a supersaturated solution can assemble and form regular crystals. It all starts from a small seed of a few molecules and continues with regular growth in all three dimensions. This process can last several days and results in crystals which are up to one millimeter in size. The regular arrangement of the molecules in the crystal lattice is essential for the use in an X-ray diffraction experiment. All right, so you have seen this. And what do we take out from this video is that proteins can be crystallized. There are many proteins that have been crystallized, uh, that, that can form crystals, that have been crystallized by researchers over time. Um, and there is essentially there is two conditions a protein sample has to meet um, so that the chances for it to form crystals uh, are high. So first of all, the protein sample has to be pure. And in this case, we speak of chemical purity. This means it has to be um, basically a single protein. It cannot be a mixture of, of different proteins. Um, and the second is um, that the, uh, the protein should also have a defined structure. And in this case, we speak of conformational purity. It means proteins which flip back and forth between different structural states um, are usually notoriously diff difficult to crystallize unless we manage to stabilize one of these um, states. In a bit more scientific manner, the, the way how a protein crystallized uh, can be illustrated in what is called a phase diagram. Yeah, this is basically a, a, a two-dimensional representation. Um, on the y-axis, we have the protein concentration, and on the x-axis, um, what is written here is adjustable parameter. Um, in the easiest case, this is uh, a salt concentration where a salt uh, is meant as a compound here which changes the solubility of the protein. Um, so, so let's have a look at this. In this area, yeah, at low protein concentration and low salt concentration, it is the salt of the, the liquid state, which is the most stable state. So, so the protein in solution, which is the most stable state. This is what we call undersaturated so, uh, zone. If we now increase the protein concentration or increase the salt concentration or increase both of them at the same time, at some point we cross this solubility line and then the solution is not the most stable state anymore. Then we move into a different zone in this phase diagram. And uh, provided that the conditions are chosen correctly, that in form. It's, just, it's slightly more complicated than the way I've just presented it. But in, uh, in essence, uh, uh, this is what happens. So we basically reduce the solubility of the protein by adding a compound that has an effect on it. And if we choose the, the, the parameters correctly, um, then we manage to form these protein crystals, which will become or which are essential for our structure determination experiment later on. The second keyword um, I ask you to memorize is X-rays. Now, what about X-rays? If you look at the um, the electromagnetic spectrum, um, the uh, electromagnetic radiation is everything basically from radio waves to gamma rays. And you can see in between there is visible light and, and X-rays and all these different radiations, they, um, they, they differ by their energy or their wavelength. Yeah? Radio waves have a very long wavelength yeah? and a very low energy and X-rays and gamma rays have a very short wavelength and a very high energy. Uh, and in between, there is microwaves and infrared and visible light and ultraviolet um, and, um, and so on. So these are all um, essentially the same radiation, electromagnetic radiation, just differing uh, by their wavelength or energy. And this whole area, which, are, um, which, are, which is illustrated by this box, um, termed synchrotron rate radiation, all these different radiations are produced or can be produced in facilities that are called synchrotrons. I'll get back to that uh, a few slides down the line.
On this slide, I would like to show you a, a top view or an aerial view of Berlin's most powerful X-ray source, Bessie 2 located in Berlin Adlershof. This is one of these synchrotrons. Um, this means a facility uh, where um, a, a lot of, of, of where, um, a very high intensity um, electromagnetic uh, radiation is produced for certain purposes, and we'll get back to it. And for this purpose, we've also um, prepared a video to show uh, to show you what is a synchrotron. Is the title of this video? So please, Jennifer, go and uh, start the next video. This is a top view of the Bessie II synchrotron in Berlin. A synchrotron is a particle accelerator in which electrons are sped up to nearly the speed of light. When these electrons are forced around a curve, they produce very strong radiation. This so-called synchrotron radiation includes all sorts of rays, from infrared to hard X-rays. For our experiment, rays of just one energy are filtered out of the entire spectrum and then focused on our protein crystal. All right, thank you very much. Back to the presentation. So synchrotrons are so-called large-scale facilities these are big machines um, the, in, in terms of, um, uh, in, with respect to Bessie, the, the diameter of the whole machine is about 80 meters. The circumference is about 240 meters. And these large scale facilities, although they are expensive to build and expensive to maintain, um, they're worthwhile to have because they're open to the entire research community. Yeah? They produce all sorts of highly intense radiation as I've shown before, from infrared to X-rays, which can be used for all sorts of peaceful research purposes. Um, I said before, they're open to the entire research community. That means every researcher that has a scientific question that may be asked, answered with the help of synchrotron radiation can apply for beam time at the synchrotron, and he or she will obtain this beam time provided that, uh, that the experiment uh, makes sense and, um, and, and can be done um, in the first place. And, and then they will uh, obtain the beam time um, essentially for free uh, in order to um, conduct their experiment. Worldwide, uh, there is several dozen synchrotrons um, which are operational. And in Hamburg, uh, in Germany, there are two of them. There's the Petra 3 synchrotron in Hamburg and uh, the one you have seen, SC2 in, in Berlin, Adlershof. So coming back to this transparency again, you have seen this already. Um, I would like to remind you again of the two keywords here, crystal and X-ray. So we bring the two together now. Um, we take our protein crystal and we shine some synchrotron radiation of a particular wavelength or energy on it. Yeah? The, um, we use X radiation, X rays, because the wavelength of X rays is in the range of the distance of the atoms in our sample. And we, so I said before, uh, what we want to find out is where all the atoms are in our, uh, our protein crystal. And for that, we need to use radiation, um, which is um, uh, with a wavelength in the ballpark of the atom atom distances, and this happens to be X rays. So we take our sample, we shine some X rays on it. On the other side, we put a, a typically a very expensive detector, and um, we see what happens. We we measure uh, what the protein crystal does uh, with the waves, and um, um, this phenomenon is explained in the next video that we are going to show. Um, titled the diffraction experiment or how to obtain a protein structure. So, Ms. Jennifer, the next video, please. Protein crystals are exposed to X-rays. 
Due to the periodic arrangement of the molecules inside the crystals, the X-rays are deflected in a characteristic way. They produce a so-called diffraction pattern. By rotating the crystal, different peaks can be recorded on the detector until a complete data set is measured. From this, the three-dimensional structure of the protein can be calculated. So this is a very brief account of, um, of a structure determination process, but it captures the essentials. Yeah. To summarize, we need to grow protein crystals. These protein crystals are exposed to highly intense X-rays. The resulting diffraction patterns are recorded and analyzed. And from these diffraction intensities, the three-dimensional structure can be calculated. Now, there is many groups, many research groups worldwide uh, who work in this area. And um, uh, so far, as of today, roughly 170,000 protein structures have been determined worldwide. And every day, there is something like 30 to 40 new ones that are added uh, to this um, uh, to this list of uh, determined protein structures. By the way, I, I should mention that, of course, all of these results are publicly available in the so-called protein data bank. So everybody with a computer and an internet connection can download this and display them or analyze them um, as he or she sees fit. Now, we are not only interested in what the proteins look like. I said before, one of the most important sentences in my lecture is that the structure determines the function of the proteins. And um, what we really want to find out how they work, how they perform their work, and how we can potentially interfere with what they are doing. Um, for this, we have to realize that in a cell, a protein is not there by itself. Yeah. Um, it, it is together with thousands of other molecules, small molecules, uh, metabolite, metabolites, other proteins, uh, DNA, RNA, blah, blah, what, whatever. So there is a, a very complicated uh, and very complex mix of chemicals inside a cell. And every protein is made to interact with something. And interaction or interacting with something means that the, that the two surfaces um, um, have to somehow come together and, um, and, and form some sort of an interaction, uh, or, or that, that the two partners um, um, un undergo this, this so-called binding event. And if we can interfere with this binding event, um, we can potentially interfere with the function of the protein. Yeah. And um, this is um, the... Uh, the, the um, this is going to be illustrated in the next video, which is uh, titled Finding Binding Partners uh, uh, for a Protein. But it will also show um, how this line of research can lead to um, ideas how to interfere with the function of the protein. So please, Jennifer, show the next uh, video. If we want to know which chemical compounds bind to a given protein, we need to bring them all together. Many of these compounds will not bind and bounce right off the surface of the protein. Some will bind loosely but leave again. And then there are a few compounds that bind tightly to the protein and stick to it. They may even bind more tightly than the protein's natural binding partner. In such a situation, the protein cannot fulfill its natural function anymore. It is inhibited. If the protein happens to be involved in a disease, we may have found a drug against this disease. So you could see that by finding um, the binding partners of a protein which binds so tightly that they interfere um, with the binding of their nat natural binding partners um, that we can actually interfere 
um, with a natural protein function. And if this protein happens to be involved in a disease, let it be a viral or a bacterial protein, um, then uh, we may have found a candidate uh, for a new drug. And how do we do this um, at uh, BESI2 in, in Arklasov? We uh, utilize a method that is called fragment screening. So we take a lot of these protein crystals, typically a few hundred of them, and we take a selection um, of uh, also a few hundred different chemical compounds. Uh, we, we can buy these from chemical companies, from, uh, from vendors. We, um, we take for, one, for each compound, we take um, uh, one crystal and we, we treat the crystal, we soak the crystal in, these, in this compound. And then we use this crystal for a diffraction experiment at one of our beam lines at Bessie. We record these diffraction patterns and uh, we obtain the three-dimensional structure. Yeah. This means if the compound binds tightly to our protein crystals, then we will see this in our three-dimensional structure. Uh, and we will not only see whether it binds, but it will, we will also see where on the protein surface it binds and how it binds. And this is the big advantage of using this uh, crystal structure analysis as a screening technique uh, for the binding of compounds to um, our protein. So finally, in, this, in, in the presentation, I would like to give you a brief account of what we have been doing using this very same method um, on an important protein uh, from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this protein is called MPRO um, or, or main protease. In order to understand what this protein is doing, um, we have to have a, a, a short look at the life cycle of a virus, of a, of a typical virus, such as the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we have the virus outside a cell, um, and the virus binds to the surface of the cell. And somehow this virus gets into the inside of the cell. Now the virus itself consists of some genetic material, that's DNA or RNA. In, this, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, it's RNA and a shell of proteins which protects this genetic material. Now, once inside the cell, the, um, the, uh, this virus capsid comes apart and the viral genetic information is integrated into the cell, it's a cellular genetic information, and the cell begins to forget about its real purpose um, and it produces viral genetic material and viral proteins. Yeah. And once there is enough of that stuff produced, new virus particles are reassembled and then the cell bursts and usually one infected cells produces several tens of thousands of new virus particles, which are then off to infect new cells. And this also illustrates uh, why when you're infected uh, by a virus, why this can uh, uh, spread very quickly uh, into the neighboring tissue and, um, and, and really make you sick. <clears throat> now, in, in case of SARS-CoV-2 and also many other viruses, these viral proteins, they are not produced as individual proteins by the cell. They are produced as what is called a polyprotein. It's like pearls on a string. So here's a protein and there is some connection to the next protein and some connection and, and so on. But as polyprotein, they are essentially useless. They, they cannot reassemble into a new virus. And um, this is where our candidate protein that cuts other proteins into pieces. And this MPRO is, um, is a, a protease that basically cuts this polyprotein into the individual proteins. And only when this uh, is successfully accomplished, then new virus particles um, can be assembled and, um, um, and the, the cell can burst and set free the new virus particles and, um, and, and, we can, and the infection can go on. This means if we could inhibit this protein MPRO, then this step could not take place and, um, and we would have found a drug against uh, SARS-CoV-2. That would basically reduce or eliminate the, the uh, uh, interfere with the 
Now, this is the three-dimensional structure of this uh, viral protease M pro. And um, uh, due to what I've just shown in the, in the uh, two slides before, this seems to be a very good target for, the, for developing a new drug. And as a matter of fact, um, when the first cases of this new lung disease were reported in China, um, people uh, or researchers have been very quick to identify this new virus and to um, and to publish its genome sequence. Yeah, it's only very early into January. This genome sequence of the of the virus was published on the web, and then. Um, the, the group of Professor Hildenfeld from the University of Lübeck, um, a group whom we are collaborating with, um, they were also very quick in, in um, starting their structural work on producing enough of this main protease of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, um, growing crystals um, to uh, perform that diffraction experiment at one of our beamlines and, and solve and, and determine the structure of this um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 protein. So there is only there. There's if you can see, it's less than a month um, between um, the time when the genetic information of this virus was reported on the web and when the first three-dimensional structure of the SARS-CoV-2 mPro protein was solved. And very quickly afterwards, the first compound screening experiments started on this program uh, protein and we were of course not the only ones there were other groups at the petra 3 synchrotron in hamburg but also at the diamond synchrotron in the in the united kingdom uh, who also conducted these compound screening experiments and identified uh, the first compounds that um, that bind to this to this protein and um also, in our experiments, we were successful in identifying a couple of binders to this protein. Um, and the question is, of course, now, where are we now? Um, this is, of course, if we look at the, at the whole drug discovery process, um, this is only the very first step in a drug discovery process. Yeah? We know now which chemical structures or which chemical compounds fit to the surface of the protein. Now we have to develop them now into larger compounds that bind more tightly. Then we have to check whether these larger compounds, whether they exert some biological effect, meaning whether they are uh, good enough to really inhibit the, the enzymatic action of this molecule, whether they are good enough to um, uh, protect cells from further infection, for, uh, for instance, by interfering with the life cycle of the virus. Then these compounds have to be analyzed um, with respect to their toxicity and, and then they have to, end, have to enter clinical trials and they have to be tried in healthy humans and then in sick humans. So this, this, this whole process lasts roughly a decade. And with our work, we contribute to the first steps and we hope that we can accelerate this process by, by having several candidate molecules that can undergo this development um, into a drug. Um, so this will, of course, not really help us in the current pandemic, but of course we need to be uh, we need to be prepared, and we need to develop many of these molecules. Uh, for instance, if we had done, uh, if we had known um, um, fifteen years ago or, or ten years ago when the when the first coronavirus outbreak uh, uh, took uh, place, if we had known then what we know now, then we would have a drug by now. Yeah, but of but of course. Everybody underestimated the situation and um, the research on developing a drug against SARS-CoV-2 only started very recently. All right, with this, I am already at the end of my presentation and I would like to thank you very much for your attention.